Welcome to Clear Creek Community Church Online. My name is Carl Garcia and I'm the campus pastor at our Clear Lake campus. Clear Creek is made up of multiple campuses located throughout the Bay Area of Houston. And while we're so glad that you joined us to watch the sermon today, you should know that we believe that life is better when we do it together. When we gather as a church, it's a non-downloadable experience. Singing together, praying together, serving together, those are all things that just don't translate online but they're essential to the entire experience of becoming a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. So I would encourage you, make plans to check out the campus nearest you and see what worshiping and living in community is really all about. You can visit us at clearcreek.org to find out information about our locations, our service times, and so much more. We hope to see you soon. Well, it's good to be with you guys today, and I'm excited just to share even a little bit of this series through the book of Revelation. This has been so good for my heart, and I think for this church, I think we've all enjoyed walking through uh, the book of Revelation together. It's been what we've needed, and so uh, I'm excited to share even a bit of this with you today. Uh, When I think about a man who's changed the world, like a powerful leader who's made an impact in the world for the better, this is the guy that I think of. I don't even need to tell you his name because we know who that is. That's Martin Luther King. Right? Martin Luther King changed the world at a time when, frankly, the world didn't want to change. It was a tough space. It was a tough time. But yet, he changed the world. And how did he do it? Well, he did it through the power of a vision. Right? He told a compelling story. On March 28, 1963, Martin Luther King stands up before some 250,000 people in Washington, D.C. That, that's, that'll give you a little bit of anxiety. And he, and he tells a compelling story. He paints a picture, an image of a world put to rights, right? He steps back and says, hey, this is what can happen. This is a world where injustice is made right. This is a world when what was once wrong is put to new. This is a world where unity is restored and racial reconciliation is made right, right? It's this beautiful picture. And this vision that he's painted is so compelling that it causes some people to live differently. Like they change the way that they live their lives. And for others, man, it gave them hope to endure. Like as they envisioned and they pictured, they say, we're gonna endure the long road of reform and change no matter how difficult it is because that's what powerful visions do. And even today, as we look at what's happening in our world and how uh, God still works and moves in this area, there's, there's, there's been a lot that's happened, but still a lot needs to be done. And I would argue that even today, MLK's vision for a better tomorrow continues to be fuel to the fire, right? Because that's what powerful visions do. They give us a picture of where we're going. They tell us this is where we're headed. And it's emboldening because it unifies a people. Like when you have a clear vision, you're unified. You you know what you're hoping in. You know where you're headed. And so you endure. And even in the midst of some of the greatest adversity, a clear vision gives people confidence to follow because it tells them where they're headed. And so why all this vision talk today? Because I believe that knowing where we're headed impacts the way that we live our lives today. It makes a difference. And so let's be visionaries together for a moment. And let me ask you, when you picture the world and where God is taking all things, what comes to mind for you? Like, what is it that you picture? When you think of eternity, what picture pops into your head? I would say for most, if you grew up in church with some type of church background, what immediately is gonna start popping up in your head is probably heaven, right? Like heaven's the end goal. How could it not be? Like heaven's the place uh, where man goes when they die. Heaven's the place where no more sin and suffering exists. Heaven's the place out of this earth. You leave this world behind you and you embrace the heaven, the ethereal kind of dwelling place of God in the clouds. And out of the two destinations that you could go to, heaven's the one that you want because the other one, well, is pretty hot. Some people, some people call it Dallas, but uh, we've got to do something with the Cowboys fans, you know what I'm saying? But if heaven's the goal, what does that mean for earth? What does that mean for the place that we're on? Well, not much, actually, because if heaven's the goal, well, then earth really doesn't matter because you're gonna eventually leave this place, and so the physical and the tangible kind of loses its relevance. You're gonna embrace the ethereal and the spiritual, like kind of like the mansion in the clouds. Earth was just a test. If you beat the game on earth, well, good. Then you get your mansion in the clouds, and you're gonna get your angel wings and your harp, and then if you're really, 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 really good, well, then you get the cloud that floats right next to Lance Lawson's. But the truth of the matter is so much that we think about heaven is really kind of a cultural thing and not really a biblical one. 
Because when we look at the scriptures, the biblical author, it didn't really mention much about heaven at all because it wasn't the point, right? And when it did talk about heaven, it certainly didn't reference harps. It didn't talk about angel wings. And it certainly wasn't the hope of all things. But somewhere down the road, it's really become the focal point and the thing that kind of drives people and says, man, this is where we're headed. But it's just simply revealed something. And the truth is it's revealed that we have a misunderstanding of what God is ultimately going to do in the world. And that creates a problem for us. And here's the problem. Here's why we need to lean in this morning. The problem that this is, it tells us, man, it gets really difficult to follow Jesus when you don't know where you're going. Like it's really difficult to follow Jesus when you don't know where all things are headed. See, that's the point of the text that we're gonna deal with today. This is where God is directing all things. Revelation 21, it's the culmination of the entire series that we've been journeying with for so long, for 11 straight weeks. It's the culmination of the book of Revelation. Like we've talked about judgment, how God is eventually going to make all things right. And so it's like, what's that world gonna now look like? Once a world's been put to rights and evil is done away with, what does that world look like? That's what the text we're gonna look at. But listen, it's more than just the culmination of the book of Revelation. It's the culmination of the entire Bible from beginning to end. This is God saying, this is what I was doing then, and this is where I'm taking all things. So let's lean in and see what John has for us as we read in Revelation 21, starting in verse 1. He starts like this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. So the first question that we need to ask is, uh, if we see a new heaven and a new earth, what was wrong with the old one, right? In order to fully understand what God is doing in the new, we must understand what happened to the old. And so in short, mankind sinned, right? In the garden, it was really the dwelling place of God. God dwelled with his creation. It was good and it was perfect, but it was not secure. And we know it wasn't secure because on the scene, we get this slithering, creeping serpent who makes its way onto the sea scene and Eve isn't freaked out at all. She just goes right up and starts talking to him and he tempts her and he wages war against God's creation, right? His goal, destroy what God had made. He wanted to take the good creation that God had made and ruin it. And so mankind falls. Man created to be the image of God could no longer reflect his creativity, his power, and his beauty. Instead, they become conduits for death, destruction, and brokenness enters the world. See, that's what happened. And so the question that comes, is this God conceding the universe over to his enemy? Like, is this God blowing up? Well, notice, this isn't, John's not saying that at all. This isn't God conceding his, his universe to his enemy. This isn't God giving it up. Right, why wouldn't he do that? Well, because John three sixteen it tells us, this is a, a text that many of us know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Right, that word world there, it's cosmos in the Greek. So yes, it includes people for sure. It certainly is referencing the people of God. That's whom he loves. But it means so much more than that. It's not just the people of God, it's also his creation, everything that he had made. And what John's telling us here is that God's not gonna destroy the very thing that he came to redeem. He's here to make a world new. But we've gotta deal with something because in that verse that we read earlier in Revelation 21.1, doesn't it not say that the new heavens and the new earth because the old one passed away? So what's that all about? What's the passing away? See, when we think about the word new in our context, we often think about the word new in the context of like chronological order. Right, like I once had the old iPhone and now I got the new iPhone, the upgraded one, the better one. And so the old one passed away and the new one came into existence. But that's not often how the Bible uses the word new. When the Bible uses the word new, it's often referring to a change in character and quality of the old because that's how gospel power works, right? It takes what is old and broken and it makes it new. Is that not what happened to us? Those who encounter the saving grace of Christ, is that not what God has done in you and in your life? This is why Paul can say in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. It's not random that Paul and John use similar language here. Don't these texts look a lot alike? It's the same gospel power that changes us. Is the same gospel power that will ultimately renew the world. God's not gonna do away with his creation just like he didn't do away with you. See, he's making a creation, a new creation for a new people. 
a people that have been changed, a creation that's been changed. That's why John first sees a new creation and then he introduces us to a new people. In the very next verse, he says, and I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So we, we've seen this before. In the Revelation, John often, often has used a, a woman to describe a people. We saw it in Revelation chapter 17 with the prostitute of Babylon. And he, he, he uses her to reference the people who have rejected God and all that he has made. And so here he contrasts this woman with another, and it's the bride of Christ. So this woman symbolizes God's covenant people. It's the nation of Israel and those who have come to faith in Jesus uh, in the church age. So that's going to be the inhabitants of this city, and they enter into a new covenant relationship with him. But I want you to notice, because John is revealing something to us. He's revealing something about the location and the destination of where this, these people will endure. And notice, th this is not a people going up, but a people coming down. They come down out of the heavens. This isn't a people trying to escape, but rather a people who are conquering. And they enter into a new covenant relationship with God, which he describes next in verses three through five. And so check this out. And I heard a loud voice from the throne of God saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. Talk about painting a picture of a better tomorrow. Right here in this text, we see the culmination, yes, of Revelation, but also the entire Bible. For, for the Bible can really be summed up in three words, three simple words, the entire Bible, God with us. You'd be like, that big lofty book, it's three words? Yes, God with us. So let me quickly take you, oh, I got like three hours. Is that how much time we have together? You guys don't got anywhere to be? All right, quick jet tour through the Bible. We'll go much quicker than that. And we're gonna show it's God with us through the entire thing. So in the book of Genesis, is that not what the garden was? It's the dwelling place of God, God dwelling with his creation. But sin fractures it. And man is kicked out of the garden. They can't enter into the presence of God. So in the book of Exodus, Moses is instructed to build the portable version of God with us. It's the tabernacle. It's this traveling tent. And it's to follow the people as they journey throughout the desert. And, and they await for the land that God has promised them. But there's a problem. Because in Exodus, it says that the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle and Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it. So the very thing, the very thing that man was created for, the presence of God, was the very thing that kept them out. God tried to dwell with his people, but there was a problem. So then we get the gospels. And Jesus comes. It's God in the flesh, literally tabernacling with his people. And he's given a name. We talk about it at Christmas. What is it? It's Emmanuel, which means... There's our three words, God with us. He's here in the present and he dwells with us. And he goes to the cross and he takes on the wrath of God on our behalf. And the wrath of God is satisfied for sin. He settles the problem, right? Man is now able to enter into the presence of God. And as a result of Christ's death on the cross, uh, something happens in the Holy of Holies. There's a curtain that hangs between it and it's ripped in two from top to bottom and, and it enables the presence of God. And, and that, the curtain, all, its whole goal was to separate the people of God from the presence of God. And it's ripped in two, symbolizing that man can once again enter into the presence of God. And so that takes us to the book of Acts. We're at Pentecost. Christ has ascended and, and is seated at the right hand of the Father and his spirit comes down on those who have uh, received faith and the grace that can only be found in Christ, and so they receive God's very spirit. It seals them. So, so this, this is the place where it's like, man, this is the thing that we all, this is, this is an incredible reality in our day, but it's not ultimately the thing that, we, um, that we're ultimately hoping in. So w w this is where we're at. We're in the church age. If you're a follower of Jesus, then you have received God's very presence. 
And I don't wanna belittle that because that's an incredible reality. Here's what that means for you. It means that every ounce of pain and misery that you are comforted by the very presence of God in the midst of this life. See, see the, the, the very presence of God seals you spiritually, but it, it does not necessarily protect you physically. And so in this age, we're still subjected to the sin and brokenness of this world. But it means that every cancer diagnosis that you've ever received, every broken relationship, every, every um, a poor deed that's been done to you or done by you, God walks with you through every step of that way. You have his very presence with you. And he comforts you in the midst of it. And, and, it, and it's, this, it's this moment where he says, I sympathize with you, I know, I understand, I walk alongside you. And he will by no means ever cast you out for you have been sealed by the very presence of God, which it is, it's this declaration to the heights of the heavens and to the depths of the abyss that you are his. But even in that, as great and grand as that is to know that God walks every step of the way with me, it is not our ultimate hope. Because in the new heavens and the new earth, all suffering and wickedness and injustice has been dealt with and God comes and he makes his home with his people. And the one who comforted you through every pain and every mis misery in this age, he meets you in the next. And he wipes the tears from your eyes he says, death will be no more. See, this is, this, is the, this is where all things have been heading. This is what God has ultimately wanted to do from the book of Genesis into now. So new creation will be what Eden was supposed to be, but better, which almost seems too good to be true, which is why John says this next. Coming from the throne, he hears this. He said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it's done. For I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. So... Um, our confidence for a better tomorrow is not wishful thinking. It's not simply hoping that one day God will come and do this. No, no, we have great confidence. Why? Because it, the one who is sovereign over the beginning is sovereign over the end. He says, I'm the alpha and the omega. I was there at the beginning. I'll be there at the end. I'm the one that's directing all things. This is a guaranteed reality. And who is it for? It's for those who have come to the feet of Jesus and said, I'm thirsty and they quench their thirst in, in him. And what does he do? Well, it says that he gives them the spring of water of life without payment. It's the only thing that can satisfy our souls. And it's a gift of his grace. You can't pay for it. He just gives it. But there's another group of people that were present in the text that we just looked at. It was those who rejected that, who said, I'm gonna quench my thirst from other places. I'll drink from other wells, uh, not eternal realities, but rather temporal ones. And we've talked about that, that throughout the revelation in uh, the judgment. We've called, they've been referred to as the earth dwellers. And it's those who reject the free gift of God's grace. But the water of life is a free gift. And it's given to all. And it's really a theme that runs throughout the entire Bible. It's seen in the garden. It's fulfilled in the person of Jesus. And we see it even here in the new heavens and the new earth. Because the point, what John is trying to make, is he's trying to connect these two realities for us. He's trying to help us see that these, these codes, these little clues are telling us that what the garden was in the beginning is what new Jerusalem, the new creation, will be at the end. So um, that, that raises some questions, I think, for, some many, for many people in the room. So if you're a pessimist, you're going to appreciate this part. Sorry, you probably prefer the term realist. Uh, if you're a realist and you're, 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 you're a, you see the world through this kind of glass half full type of lens, the question that pops up in your mind, okay, if the garden was capable of falling in the beginning, what's keeping it from falling here at the end? It's a good question because John is either a pessimist himself or he just has a compassion on those that are, because in the next section, he, he, he spends some time dealing with that, and he actually starts the vision over. He recapitulates it, if you will. 
He starts it from the beginning, and this time he's telling it from a little different perspective. And for for time's sake, we're not going to read the whole thing together, but I'm going to summarize it quickly for you because, um, again, uh, he's going to deal with a lot of details, a lot of numbers, a lot of measurements, what's in the city, the physical details. And a lot of people want to look at this stuff and, like, add it up and try to find the secret code that might be in there, and, and it's not there, right? Because most of this is pointing to a greater reality. It symbolizes something that God wants us to see. So let me do this. So first he starts with the initial appearance of the city. And just like earlier, it represents God's people. This is the people of God. Who are they? It's it's true Israel, the covenant people of God from both the Old and the New Testament. But the next thing that he points out is the measurements of the city. And that symbolizes God's protection. He measures the heights of the walls. Like this is how high these walls are gonna be. You're gonna be protected. And then he deals with the materials of the city, and those symbolize God's very presence throughout the city. And then the features of the city, and those represent God's provision for it. In other words, this city is going to be impenetrable. Eden, old Eden, it was completely good, but it wasn't completely secure. Old Eden was abundant, but it wasn't yet expansive. Adam and Eve were created in the very image of God, but they were fully glorious and thus they were subjected to sin. But listen to the way that new Eden, new creation, the new heavens and the new earth, listen how John closes this vision out, starting in verse one of chapter 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as a crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the lamb and through the middle of the streets, also on either side of the river, the tree of life, that's from the garden, with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And no longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the lamb will be in it and his servants will worship him. They see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and night will be no more for they they need no light of lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. That's where we're headed. That's creation made new. It's not some ethereal retirement in the sky, but rather it's physical, tangible, glorified creation where heaven comes down and God makes his home with his people and it's the redemption of the nations. So that's the text for today. So let me ask you this. How does that compare with the vision that you have for all of eternity? A world without end. You see, the world would love to sell you something lesser than what John has given us in Revelation 21. It would love for you to buy into something smaller, more insignificant, something temporal to build your life upon. Because the enemy behind it all, the world, it knows that what you think about eternity and where all things are headed, that ultimately it impacts the way that you live your life even now. See, if your view is one day that you're just gonna escape into the heavens and you're gonna and leave this earth behind you and one day this earth will be destroyed, well, you're just gonna live safely up in the clouds. How do you think that affects the way that you approach the dark spaces of your life? Right, the places that you encounter that God so ultimately wants to work in and move in, well, those are spaces to be feared, not, not spaces to be redeemed. And so we avoid those spaces. We don't run into those spaces All the while, God's inviting his people to run into those places because God's a God of restoration. He's he's a God of taking old things and making them new. So for that, for us, that might be your home. That might be your neighborhood, your place of work, your school. God is God. We're not ultimately waiting for a reset button to be hit. We're waiting for God to restore all things. But maybe there's another group of people who they don't really have a vision for much outside of their own life. You don't have a vision of what God's ultimately doing in all of eternity because the vision that you've bought into isn't eternal but rather temporal. Like Jesus is a part of your life and you'll go to church and you'll sit in these seats but ultimately outside of that, I don't think much about that. What I'm banking my life on is what I can acquire here in this world. What I can build for myself. Man, I'm gonna build my bank account. I'm gonna chase the fast life. I'm gonna gonna, gonna achieve all the accolades, have the family that I've always wanted. Like that's what I'm basing my life on. But here's the truth. When you have a temporal or lesser vision than what John has given us, 
it becomes really difficult to follow Jesus when life gets really hard. Like when suffering hits. When that cancer diagnosis comes through. When death takes place. When, the t- when you look at the totality of your life and you begin to ask yourself the question, like, have I done anything that matters? Like, do I matter? When you start to deal with anxiety and depression and loneliness, when the job that you begin to bank your life on starts to kind of just like slip through the cracks, it's like, man, it, oh, how quick does suffering and pain expose just how frail lesser visions actually are? Because it's really difficult to follow Jesus when you don't know where you're going. But that's why texts like the one that John gives us here are so beautiful and so powerful because it tells us this is where all things are headed. And this is what God is doing in the world. And for some of you, it it might even change the way that you live your life. You, You say, man, God, I've bought into lesser visions. I want nothing less than to submit my entire self to you the way that I love my family. I want to love them the way that you've called me to, the way that I lead my home, the way that I interact with my neighbors, the way that I live my very life. I submit it all to you and you alone. But for others, it might give you the hope that you need to endure even in the, li- even in the midst of life's greatest tragedies. Like for the people in John's day, it helped them endure the demonic onslaught as, they, as the Roman nation tried to slaughter them and, and wipe out Christianity. You don't think that John 21 ran through their hearts and mind as they uh, pressed in and continued to uh, advance the gospel. Like the church exploded in the midst of that. Why? Because they had a clear vision of where all things were headed and they had an ultimate hope that wasn't rooted in their earthly experience but rather what God was doing in all things. And as I look across these seats and I look at the people in this room, I know that there's many of you who have walked through some very difficult seasons, seasons of suffering, and yet you've endured. I mean, I think of people like Dave and Denise Ward who have faithfully followed Jesus and faithfully served this campus but they've also seen some pretty dark days. You know, 2018, their world was rocked when they lost their beloved 33-year-old son, Bill Ward. And you can't plan for something like that. But you know what? The world looks at Dave and Denise and how they've responded in the midst of that, in their grief and in their suffering, and they're baffled because they don't get it. Because in the midst of their own grief and their own suffering, they use it as a means to point people to the goodness of God in their life. Like, what? And they use it as a moment to tell others who are walking through similar seasons of life, similar difficulties, and saying, this is what God can ultimately do in you and in your world. They use their story to point people to biblical community because they know how important it is. And they use their story to show how God has been faithful to them even in the midst. And you want to know how they do that? Because they have a hope that is rooted in what God is ultimately doing in the world. See, a clear vision helps us follow even in the midst of some of life's greatest struggles. Because great confidence in what God is going to do in the world. Man, and I know that there are so many people in this room who have similar experiences and similar stories and similar sufferings. Oh, how we long for the day when the one who walked through every suffering in this age with us meets us in the next and says, my dwelling place is with man. And he wipes the tears from our eyes and death is no more. And the voice from the throne declares, I have made all things new. That's our hope. Would you pray with me? Father, would you help us as we lean into you today to not buy into anything lesser than what you have called us to, to what you have showed us here in Revelation 21. It's the hope of the nations. It's the hope of healing. 
It's the hope that ultimately you are driving all things, and it is a guaranteed reality, God. So would you anchor our very souls to that? And we as a people collectively together respond, come quickly, Lord Jesus. We ask all this in the name of your son, Jesus.